All right. I'd like to thank Adam for inviting me to come in and uh, visit with you tonight. If you have any questions as we're going along, please feel free to ask them. Uh, Adam asked me to talk about frost seeding, and we're going to talk about that as part of this kind of overall renovation plan for pastures. We've, we've had a, a couple of tough years for uh, pastures, and a lot of them could use a little tender loving care. And so I want to just kind of take you through a step-by-step -step process to think about how, how we take a pasture that's kind of been damaged by drought and, and maybe a little bit overgrazing and get it back in shape for next year. So one thing I always like to mention is that when we talk about pasture renovation, the first thing that always pops into our mind is, is we've got to reseed that pasture. And that's not always necessarily true. There's a lot of other things that really has to happen before we go to that final step of reseeding that pasture. And, and I want to kind of take you through those steps as, as we go tonight. The first one I want to mention may be a little bit different than you're used to hearing about, but but it has to do with stocking rate. And a lot of times when we get into the situation where our pastures are really in bad shape, we have to ask ourselves, what, what happened? Sometimes it's drought, sometimes it's flood, but, but a lot of times we may be stocked a little bit higher than, than we should be. And that's kind of what this diagram shows. So we've got two lines on this diagram. We've got output per unit of land area, and then we've got output per individual animal. And that's the dotted line. And then we've got stocking rate, and as stocking rate increases, as you would imagine, our output per unit land area increases to a point. And that's, that's important to realize. Once you get to a certain point and you keep increasing your stocking rate or the number of anim animals you have on your farm, all of a sudden the whole system kind of crashes. You have too many animals and the forage can't grow fast enough and they're grazing it down before it has a chance to recover and next thing you know you've got pastures that look like this tabletop and they're not productive and that's when the whole thing decreases. Now as we start to increase stocking rate you'll see that our, our gain per animal tends to decrease and, and that's, that's normal so our, our output per unit land area is increasing, our gain per animal is decreasing and where those two lines converge, that's kind of the optimal stocking rate. So we're, we're producing the most we can produce in a sustainable manner per land area, but our animal performance is not the highest. Where animal performance is the highest, that means individual animals are doing well, but, but we don't have very many to sell because we're stocked too low. So we want to be where those two lines cross at. Where we really get into trouble in, is where we're stocked too high. And, and that's where neither animal performance um, nor uh, production per unit land area are optimized. Why am I telling you this? Because I, I want you to think about, you know, what your stocking rate is for your farm. And you're probably saying, well, what's the ideal stocking rate? And I'm going to say it depends a little bit on the type of pastures you have, the type of soils you have. Um, in, the, in how you manage those pastures. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through these slides. But in general terms, somewhere between two to three acres per cow-calf unit is going to really be where you need to be thinking about. If you're down closer to two, then you really need to be on top of management. If you're closer to three, um, your management can be a little bit more lax, but that that three acres per cow-calf unit is going to give you the opportunity to extend grazing and reduce the number of hay feeding days that you have in your system. Hay feeding days are negatively correlated with profitability in cow-calf operations. Hay is a much more expensive way to feed animals than allowing them to harvest their own forage. So the second step that I want to talk about in terms of pasture renovation tonight is, is controlling problem weeds. And, um, and Adam was telling me about his weed control on his farm, or sometimes lack of. And, uh, in, in weeds, I, I think we've got to step back and ask ourselves first what a weed is. And what is a weed? 
in a pasture. I know what a weed is in a cornfield, right? Something other than corn, right? What, how about a pasture? What's a weed in a pasture? That's exactly right. I like the way you think. And if, if it's in a pasture and the cows are eating it, then it's not really a weed. It's what I call a forb, right? So, it, in, and, uh, so it's something we can't figure out how to get the cow to eat in a pasture. And, and we have some of those for sure. But a lot of times if we have good pasture management, they'll eat a lot of, a lot of things that we commonly consider weed that we didn't actually grow in that pasture. Weeds are often a symptom of a, a problem rather than a problem themselves. A lot of times we say, well, the weeds are taking my pasture over. Well, it's not, not really the weeds taking your pasture over. It's, it's all this other stuff that's happening. Maybe low soil fertility. Maybe I'm grazing my pastures too close. I have too high of a stocking rate. And um, next thing I know, I graze my desirable forages out of the stand, and that leaves open soil. What grows in an open soil? A weed. And... Um, so, so what do I do? I go to the co-op and I say, well, I've got all these weeds in my pasture. Do you have something you can spray on my pasture? And they'll say, sure, and we've got some great pasture herbicides. Kill the weeds dead. But what do we have after we spray that herbicide? We've got an open spot in the pasture. What grows in an open spot in the pasture? More, more weeds. So it's kind of like a revolving door. We've got to be really careful with the weed control program that we're addressing not just, not not just the, the main symptom of the weed, but the underlying, the underlying problems that have caused that weed to grow in that pasture. So we really need to have an integrated program, a weed control program. We like to talk about herbicides, but really a weed control program starts with things like making sure your soil fertility is right, um, making sure that you have well-adapted forage species. I can grow Timothy here, but is it a good idea? Probably not, because it's not real persistent in this region of the country. You want something that's well adapted and is going to do well. you got to step back and ask yourself about your grazing management. How's your stocking rate? Is it too high? Am I resting my pastures between grazing events, or do I have too many animals to do that? And then the last thing in the integrated weed control program would be herbicide use. I'm not against herbicides. The, the problem is, is they don't work as well if you don't have all these other things happening at the same time that you're using herbicides. You've got to figure out why you've lost that stand and then get something in those holes in that pasture that are going to be productive. And we've got a great publication, and Adams, I saw that publication on display out there. If you need one, grab one. It identifies the weeds and major pasture weeds. It's by Dr. Green. And then it tells you, this is the most valuable part, it's got the different herbicides on and then it tells you how well those herbicides do for a specific weed. But more importantly, it tells you when to apply that herbicide. Because it's not just applying a herbicide. You've got to apply them at the right growth stage to make sure that you get the optimum value of that herbicide or give it the best chance to kill that weed. And if you ever need weeds identified, come see Adam. If he can't, <laughs> if he, he's probably got them on his farm. <laughs> but... If he can't identify it, he can get it to somebody that can identify it, and, and we'll certainly help him with that. Um, the third step in a kind of an integrated pasture renovation program is, is to uh, uh, evaluate your soil fertility in your pastures. And I know we tell you that all the time, but I can't tell you it's such an important part of an integrated program to understand and have a base level of soil fertility in your pastures. You don't have to have it in the high range but, but we want you to be in the medium range for soil test values. And by doing that, we create an environment in which are improved forages like red clover and white clover and orchard grass and uh, tall fescue can thrive. When our soil fertility gets low, what do we see in pastures? You all, all know, I know Adam doesn't have any on his farm, right? Bro broom straw? Yeah, and we'll see a lot of that this time of the year. And, and that's an indication that something's kind of out of balance with your soil fertility. Sometimes it's phosphorus, sometimes it's pH, sometimes it's potassium, but something's not quite right. But we can't tell just by looking at that pasture what's out of balance. That's why you need to do a soil test. It's going to quantify things like phosphorus and potassium in, in your soil pH. Um, 
does not quantify nitrogen. So we make nitrogen recommendations based on previous yield trials. Nitrogen is very hard to measure in the soil because it's such a mobile nutrient. You know, and it gives us a baseline to, to design a, a, a fertility program off of. If we don't have a soil test, we're just kind of guessing at what the pasture needs. And that's not a good place to be, especially when soil uh, fertilizer values are really high. So when, when, when we have a soil test, we can really target our application. We can put on just potassium if we need it or just phosphorus if we need it. Probably one of the worst things that you can do is put on a triple 19. I know nobody in here does that. But when you put on a triple 19, you're over applying one nutrient, under applying another nutrient in most cases. And then just keep track of it. You don't have to soil test your pastures every year, but every two or three years, it's nice to get a soil test and um, just kind of see where your fertility is. Now in a hay situation, um, if you're intensively managing that hay, a soil test every year would be good. We have a nice soil test publication, and Adam's probably, if he doesn't have any out there, he can make you a copy. It just, it just uh, reminds you of things to do when you're soil sampling hay fields and pastures to make sure you get a good sample. Soil samples are not worth a lot if it's not a good representative sample of what your, of your field or your pasture. So you need to make sure that you get a good sample. Um, if your soil test calls for lime, lime is one of the best investments that you can make. So if you're on a budget and everybody's on a budget and, and you've got a certain amount of money for soil fertility, if you need lime, lime's gonna give you the most bang for your buck because it's gonna make everything else in the soil more plant available, all the other nutrients. So um, low soil pH is still a major factor in limiting forage production, not just in Kentucky, but the whole southeastern United States. It does two things. It reduces the availability of other nutrients in the soil to plants, and it reduces nitrogen fixation in legumes like red clover and white clover and alfalfa. Liming neutralizes that soil acidity and it supplies calcium and magnesium. And these are just some general guidelines. For, for most of our, our pastures, we're going to want to be between 6 and 6.4. If we're in that range, then we've created a good environment for those improved pasture grasses and legumes to thrive in. The exception would be alfalfa. If we're growing alfalfa, then we really want to be around 6.5 to 6.8. The fourth uh, step in pasture renovation is that if you're not resting your pastures between grazing events, it's a good idea to implement some type of a rotational stocking system. And, and when I say rotational stocking, it conjures up all kinds of these scenarios in your head where you're going to have to move fence every 12 hours or every day, and, and that's not true. Most of us can implement a, ro a rudimentary rotational stocking system just by closing some gates on our farm. And if we close gates routinely and we allow that pasture to rest while they're grazing this pasture, we've implemented rotational stocking. When we switch from a rotational stock, from a continuous system to a rotational stocking system, we're going to improve pasture productivity by about 30%. So it's a, it's a significant increase in productivity in terms of pasture. The other thing it does for us is it improves nutrient distribution within the pastures. So when I put animals in a smaller area and make them graze that area, the, the distribution of dung and urine within that pasture, and remember animals will excrete about 80% of the nutrients that come in the front end go out the back end. When I get a more uniform distribution of those nutrients, that's going to help improve soil fertility in that pasture. Another benefit of rotational stocking is um, we're out there with the animals, moving them on a regular basis. So they get used to that and they handle better because of that, right? So when we come out, instead of shoving them into a chute and giving them a shot, something's good is happening every time they see us. And that's a big benefit in terms of animal handling. The, the fourth thing that's important um, is drought tolerance in pastures. So when I start to transition from a continuous to rotational stocking system, one of the first things that most producers notice is that their pastures tend to grow longer into dry periods and come out of dry periods faster. And you're probably saying, well, why is that? Because what we do to the top of the plant impacts what's below the soil. So when I graze that pasture real close all the time, I'm making my root system smaller on that grass. When I 
graze it down to say five inches and move to another pasture, I'm keeping that root system large. In the, in the larger the root system, the longer it's going to grow into a drought stress. So when we think about drought management, one of the most important things that we can do is get our stocking rate right and then rotationally stock our pasture so that we can keep a healthy and, and productive uh, root system on that plant. So when we talk about implementing rotational stocking, we've got to go into it with the right attitude. Don't do it because I told you to do it or Adam told you to do it or your NRCS person told you to do it. Do it because you want to. If you're going into it and saying, well, this is never going to work, chances of you being successful with it are pretty slim. You're going to have droughts and floods and, and hail storms, but, but if you have the right attitude, you'll kind of find your way around those roadblocks and, and have success. So with control grazing or rotational stocking, one thing that's key is having water in those pastures. And Adam and I were just talking about that before the meeting. You know, having a, a well-placed watering point allows you to do rotational stocking. If you don't have that well-placed watering point, it becomes very difficult to rotationally stock. And that's where one of the um, cost share programs, EQIP from NRCS, is very important because they'll fund... I don't know, 70 to 90 percent, depending if you're a beginning producer, of installing those watering systems in those pastures. So that's a really important tool that you could use to improve grazing management. And then we're managing how close those pastures are grazed and how long they get rested. Those are the two things that we manage. The, the closer we graze the pasture, the smaller that um, solar panel, we can kind of think of a pasture as a solar panel, the closer we graze it, the smaller it gets and the longer it's going to take to regrow. If we leave four to five inches of, re of residual area, leaf area in that pasture all the time, then that pasture is going to regrow very quickly after grazing. And then we talked about in improvements on productivity and drought tolerance. Talked about nutrient cycles. Um, in, in the intensity of rotational grazing, it, it's going to depend on what you want to do. You can do it really intensive and move animals every two to three days, but you don't have to. If, if you work a public job and you want to move animals on a Friday or a Saturday or a Sunday, then you plan your system accordingly to move them once a week. And that's going to be much better than a continuously stocked system. So it, it has to have flexibility and it has to meet the wants and needs of what you want to do on your particular farm. And the last thing I'll just say about flexibility is that when we design a rotational grazing system, make sure and, and take time and get your watering points where you want them within that system. That will allow you to, to intensify management if you decide you want to in the future. So instead of putting it in a fence line between two pastures, put a water in the middle of each pasture. That allows you to subdivide those two pastures into each into four additional pieces if you want to in the future. So building that flexibility up on the front end with the watering system is really important. Don't undersize your pipe. Um, when you switch from a one inch pipe to a one and a half inch pipe, you don't just double the water flow or make it 50% more, you're making it about four times more water flow. So take the time, invest in a little bit larger pipe in your pastures, um, and that'll give you the ability to have lots of water and expand that system as you move forward. We have a nice publication on rotational grazing that you can download or Adam can download for you if you would like a copy of it. So the fifth step in this whole renovation process is, is to think about um, choosing adapted species and adapted varieties. So we want to make sure that, that what we're growing is regionally adapted. So what's that mean? That means that I can go to Minnesota and they may have a grass in Minnesota that grows really well, but when I bring it down here to um, western Kentucky, it doesn't do so well. So we've got to make sure that we choose species that are adapted here. Not even just adapted here, but also adapted to the soils on our farm. So if I have some bottom land that's, that's pretty good land, but it's poorly drained, it's not a good choice for something like alfalfa that can't stand wet feet. So we've got to choose species that are adapted to both the region and the soil types that we have on our farm. And then we want to make sure that we use good varieties. And... Uh, the University of Kentucky has probably one of the most extensive variety testing programs in the 
country, we harvest about 5,000 plots annually in our variety testing program. And they're all summarized in this publication, Long-Term Summary of Kentucky Forge Variety Trials. Um, and Adam can get you a copy of that too if you, if you would like to have one. This is kind of the go-to. We have individual publications for each species, but all the species are summarized in here. And they're summarized in a table that looks like this. And I know you can't read this, but they have different varieties. This is a summary for white clover. These are all the different varieties that have been tested over the years. And then it, it shows you how many years they were tested. And then the last column is the most important one. And that's the mean of all the years that it was tested. And I know you can't read that, so I blew some of those numbers up. For example, this particular variety uh, is, let's see here, Regal Grays. It was tested 10, 10 site years, and it had 116. That last column puts things um, on a relative basis. So the average for the trial would be 100. So we can rank varieties either being above or below average. So we always want to choose varieties that are 100 or better for the trial. This happens to be 116, so that's producing 16% more than the average variety in the trial. And then we've got one at the top that was 71%. That's pretty important to know. That's a variety that you don't want to choose to put to overseed your pasture with. It's producing 30% less than the average variety in the trial. And that's kind of how you use the, this table in there. And there's one of these tables for each different forage species that we test. And if you ever need help making decisions, just get with Adam and I, and we'd be happy to help you go through there and choose varieties that you can get locally here. Um, all right, so, so we're to the point where we've controlled weeds, we've adjusted soil fertility, we chose a good variety and we want to get it back in our pasture. And a lot of times we think about completely killing the pasture, but I'm, I'm, it, it's hard to make that pencil out in many cases. And I will be much more in favor of kind of interceding things back into a, suppre a suppressed pasture. And, um, and we can do that several ways. We'll talk about those different ways in a second. But the first step in getting that done successfully is suppress the existing sod. So I told you not to graze it too close. This is the exception to that rule. So if I want to suppress a sod, what I want to do is I want to graze it hard. That removes the residue and it keeps it, and it suppresses the vigor of that sod and that's going to allow you to get something else established in that sod. That's the only time I'll tell you to abuse your pasture is when you're getting ready to either intercede or proceed into that pasture. It does a couple things. It allows that seed to get in contact with the soil. It reduces shading of the seedlings as they start to germinate and come up. And with, the best way to do this with, is with um, hard grazing prior to um, renovation. The seventh step is to make sure you get that seed in contact with the soil. And there's a number of different ways to do that. We can frost seed. We can no-till that, that seed into the pasture. We can use minimum tillage, which will be we disturb some soil in the pasture, not, not all of it, but maybe 40% sod disturbance. Broadcast that seed on and call a packet could be a good way to do that. A lot of people out west will talk about livestock seeding. That's where you feed seed to livestock, say in a mineral supplement or a feed supplement, and it goes through the animal, and the hard seed comes out the back and germinates. Just don't do that. It's not, it's not a great idea for this part of the country. You're much better off to broadcast that seed onto the pasture. If you look at, at a dung pile, even with intensive grazing management, it takes about three to five years to get one dung pile per square foot in a pasture. And I feel sorry for the poor graduate student that had to do that project. <laughs> but um, but um, so don't do that. Broadcast the seed on if, if rather than using uh, livestock seeding. Regardless of what method you're using, the goal is always the same. The goal is to get good soil to seed contact. If we get good soil to seed contact, then that seed has a chance of germinating and producing a viable seedling. If we don't have good soil to seed contact, then it's going to be much harder to get a viable seedling from that seed. Okay, I want to talk just a little bit about frost seeding, and um, Adam wanted me to specifically address this tonight. And, and this is simply broadcasting seed on the soil, soil surface. In a lot, and we do this in late winter 
and allow the freezing and the thawing action of the soil and the soil heaves up to incorporate that seed in there. Works best with red and white clover, not as well with alfalfa and grasses. And that freezing and thawing is what kind of incorporates that seed into the soil. For this to work, we've got to have a pasture that's really closely grazed. Works best with red and white clover. It doesn't work as well with grasses and alfalfa. And, and the preparation for frost seeding really begins that season before, right? So all this takes a little bit of planning. But all those things that we've talked about already, controlling bad weeds, if we have really bad broadleaf weeds, say the horse nettle or something that's perennial in that pasture, then we want to get those under control before we broadcast that seed on. Because if we use a herbicide, we're going to kill those new seedlings. Um, we want to soil test and adjust fertility to make sure that we have a good environment for those uh, clovers to grow in that pasture. And then we want to reduce residue by hard grazing just prior to establishment. So this is just some tips for success with frost seeding. Graze your pastures hard to reduce plant residue and reduce the vigor of that sod. Um, get seed on early so there's plenty, plenty of time. It seems like our winters are getting more and more mild and we need more time for that freezing and thawing action to incorporate that seed into the pastures. So get it on, I would say start to do it first or second week of February, get that seed on and um, allow that freezing and thawing to incorporate it. This is one of the biggies that, that often is the difference between success and failure with frost seeding and that's controlling competi competition after seeding. So we get do everything right and, and the seedlings germinate and then we, we don't control competition from that existing sod. When we don't do that, that sod grows around those seedlings and shades them out. The best thing we can do is leave animals on a pasture after we frost seed or feed some hay on that pasture. And, and the reason why is that they'll pick around and as that sod starts to grow in the spring, they'll keep it open, they'll let the light to those ex seedlings that have germinated. And people are horrified that they're going to kill a few seedlings in that pasture. And they will kill a few seedlings by walking on them or grazing them off. But if we don't keep that sod open, we'll lose all those seedlings. When the seedlings get high enough that they're starting to get nipped off by the cow, that's when we take the cows out. And we let them get to about six to eight inches tall. And then we can put that pasture back in rotation. We want to use high quality seed. Um, so it's not the cheapest thing, not buffalo alfalfa, Adam. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but we want to use good quality seed. And um, if we're using a public variety, we want to make sure that it's certified. So Kenlin is a good, is, it was a red clover that was developed at the University of Kentucky. Still one of the best red clovers that we have. Really old variety. But you have to buy, if you use Kenlin, make sure you get certified seed that has a blue tag on it. That guarantees that it's Kenlin in the bag. If it's not certified, then it could be anything in the bag. We, we just don't know for sure. Sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. Um, Jimmy Henning did research, he's my colleague, with um, certified and uncertified Kenland. Certified Kenland, um, uncertified Kenland yielded about 70% of what regular Kenland yielded. So it's a pretty big yield hit for um, buying the uncertified seed. Doesn't always happen, but, but it can. So we want to use high quality seed. We want to use the correct seeding rate. We're going to talk about seeder calibration outside in just a, just a minute. That's often easier said than done when you're looking at these little spinner seeders to get them calibrated well. And, um, and then get even seed distribution. And this is kind of where some of these um, technologies like us, these small portable GPS units can really help you because it's often hard to see where you've driven in a pasture. And often you get skips and, and overlaps within that pasture. So using some type of a small GPS unit that shows you where you've been in that pasture and uh, can really reduce the amount of skips and overlaps. We did a study, I don't think I put it in here for time's sake, but we did a study at the research station where I had two technicians drive um, four pastures. The pastures ranged about two to four acres apiece. And they, they either did it with GPS or without GPS. When they did not use GPS, they had 35% overlap. So they were trying to compensate for misses. And when they used GPS, they reduced that overlap to 3%. So 
that's a significant difference in seed cost. If, if, you, um, if you calculate that out, in most cases, you could pay for that GPS unit when you frost seed about 200 acres of pasture. Yeah, this one, this one was my favorite by far. It's a Cruiser II, um, and, uh, but they don't make this particular unit anymore. So there's some, some other units are, that are available. I've got one outside I'll show you uh, that you can buy. And there's, there's some from Europe that are becoming popular too that work with an iPhone or an iPad. So, um, yeah, this was made by Raven. And Trimble has a lower entry level one to an easy guide 250 or 350. And they cost anywhere from, from $1,000 to $2,500, depending on the unit that you get. Be a great cost share item that you could borrow from the extension office if you could talk your extension agent into to getting one. And, and making sure, and Junior just walked in, so it reminded me <laughs> that. that uh, that, um, you know, they have to be set right. Junior tried to use one from Crittenden County that uh, Susan had. and Lion. Lion. Oh, sorry, yeah. Lyon County, sorry. <laughs> from Lyon County, it, but it, it, it made them insane because the sensitivity wasn't set right on it. So every time you move just a little bit, the light bar would go crazy on it. So making sure that they're set up right is, is really important. Okay, we've got a newer publication on frost seeding, and, and Adam can get you a copy of that if you like it. And it kind of goes over some of those things that we talked about tonight. Uh, and it's a, good, it's a good short publication. It's just a back and front one-page publication. Everything's bulleted, so it's easy to read. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, no-till drilling um, into pastures and existing sods. And, and this does take more effort, and, and um, it takes more attention to the detail. Um, but generally, you get pretty consistent results if you do it right because you're actually putting that seed in contact with the soil. So when we frost seed, we're counting on that heaving and freezing and thawing to incorporate that seed. And when we no-till, we're actually putting it into the soil. And we can do this in the spring or the fall. Best method for grasses and alfalfa, generally grasses don't overseed well in pastures without some type of either minimal soil disturbance or, um, um, or no tilling. So again, we suppress the sod and reduce residue just like we had talked about earlier. We want to calibrate the drill prior to seeding. I know that's something that's hard to do, but we've got a really easy procedure, and Adam knows how to do it. We did it when we did some summer annual stuff over in Crittenden County. Um, so it's, it's a, we've got a really nice video on our, our web page that you can go and watch. It takes about 10 or 12 minutes to watch it, and it shows how to calibrate a, a grain drill in a stationary position. It works, and we've got a publication on that too, and it works for about any drill that you can use, a hay buster, a Great Plains, John Deere, it doesn't matter. That's the, that's the chart from the publication. And essentially all you do is you turn, the, you jack it up, you turn that drive wheel, you have to, the only thing, math you have to do is take 150 and divide it by the circumference of the drive wheel, and that tells you how many times to turn that, and then you wheel, and then you can just use this chart this is your seating rate in the top row, and then this is your uh, distance between disc openers that tells you how many grams of seed to catch per opener. Pretty simple procedure, and uh, if you watch the this video, it'll it'll all make sense to you. <laughs> I I supervise. <laughs> yeah, it's either a graduate student or extension agent that turns the wheel. <laughs> okay, so, so one of the biggest places that we make a mistake when we no-till small seed of forages into pastures is our seeding depth. We only want it to be a half of an inch. If it's going deeper than half an inch, it's going too deep for most of our small seed of forages. So make sure to check and recheck your seeding depth. Don't take Adam's word on it. Make sure and check because it's going to change from pasture to pasture, soil type to soil type, moisture different moistures, it's going to go deeper in this hole. So make sure and check 
take a little time and dig a little seed up, make sure it's not going. A good general rule is if you don't see a little seed near the slit on the soil surface, you're probably going a little bit too deep. And this, is, uh, this was actually in Crittenden County, I think, when, when I had Jessica Buckman, she's now an extension agent, and, and Hunter Adams were my interns. That may be, is that Adams standing there? <laughs> oh, that maybe that's me. I don't know, it, but um, but they're checking and, and rechecking the seeding depth on this summer annual field that we planted there. And then again, control competition, like we talked about, and that brings us to step eight: control competition. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because we've already talked about it. But but make sure that we 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 give those seedlings a chance to come up and make sure that they have light. Um, and we can do that by flash grazing. So we can turn a bunch of animals in for a short period of time on a small area and let them graze the top of that canopy off. If you ever watch an animal graze, it doesn't graze one plant to the ground usually. It kind of grazes um, in zones. So it'll graze the top of the canopy and then keep going down. Usually the top of the canopy will be the best quality forage in the stand. As you get lower, you get into the stems. So um, make them graze. Uh, down to let light in for those seedlings. All right, so this is just my checklist. Control problem weeds, adjust soil fertility, implement rotational stocking, choose adapted forage species um, and, and varieties, suppress the sod, make sure you get good soil to seed contact. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're using frost seeding or a grain drill or minimum tillage, you want to get that seed in contact with the soil so it has a chance to germinate and come up. And then control post seeding competition. This is often where we, where we fail when we're renovating pastures is that controlling that post seeding competition. All right, and just a couple of resources for you to finish up with, and, and this is our UK Forages website. I, I think it's probably one of the best Forages website in the country. It's got a couple things happening here. If you're interested in forage educational events, it's got upcoming forage events and livestock events underneath this blue button. It's a big blue button. The first thing you see when you get on the page, you just click on that. It shows you where all the upcoming events are. We publish a forage newsletter every month on the first of the month, and we're pretty religious about it. Um, so if you're interested in getting that, you can go to the web page and look at it here, or you can click here, it says click to su subscribe to the uh, newsletter. And if you click there and put your email in every month on the first of the month, you'll get an email from, from us with a PDF version of the forage newsletter. And then all the information on this web page is organized underneath these little I call them tiles or icons. And if you want to know something about alfalfa, you click on this. If you want to know something about um, variety trials, you can click on this icon and so on. There's about 12 of those icons that all this information is kind of organized underneath. And the way you get to it is really easy. You just in, in your search bar, just type in UKY forages and it's going to pull up. That'll be the first thing on the list and you just click on the website. Take. The last resource I just want to talk about is our, our YouTube channel. We've got about 500 videos on this YouTube channel related to forage and livestock management. And um, if we do a conference or we do an extension meeting, we record that presentation. That's why I'm wearing this microphone tonight. And then we'll, we'll make a, a video. It'll be the slides with my voiceover talking or whoever's talking. And we post it on this website. Um, if you want to get to this, you just search KY Forages YouTube, and it's going to be the first thing that pulls up. There's two search bars on this page. There's one at the top, and that searches all of YouTube, and then there's one kind of in the middle of the page, and that's the one you want to search if you want to find something on this uh, KY Forages YouTube channel. Is there any questions? All right, let's go outside and we'll take a quick look at the um, at this little cedar. <laughs>